Good afternoon. My name is Melissa Skid, and I'm the Senior Associate Director of Cardiovascular Marketing at Beringer Ingelheim. It is my pleasure to welcome you to today's product theater, the impact of EMPA Reg Outcome. Our presenter is Dr. Narendra Singh, Clinical Associate Professor at the Medical College of Georgia at Augusta University and Director of Clinical Research at NSC Cardiology in Johns Creek, Georgia. After Dr. Singh's clinical presentation, we will also have Q&A, so please enter your questions and we'll try to get as many as we can. I will now turn it over to Dr. Singh to begin today's theater. Great. Thank you, Melissa, and thanks everybody for uh, taking um, uh, the opportunity to uh, listen to this uh, presentation. Just do a, if I can get the uh, slide advanced. Slide's not advancing right now. Okay, there we go. Um, this is a um, uh, FDA approved uh, uh, presentation. It's not approved for continuing medical education. It's supported uh, by uh, Boring Engelheim Pharmaceuticals and Lilly USA. And what we're going to uh, start with, as you know, as cardiologists, um, uh, pharmacotherapy is a, a mainstay of our management of patients with coronary artery disease. And two uh, truly landmark trials um, that have uh, shaped our management of CAD patients is the 4S trial looking at the use of simvastatin in patients with CAD and reducing cardiovascular death. And then the HOPE study looking at an ACE inhibitor ramipril in reducing uh, cardiovascular deaths. And you can see the numbers needed to treat in these two patient populations. Those studies have made uh, an impact. And uh, as this slide shows, uh, with the initiation of uh, statins and uh, ACE inhibitors, we've seen a, a very impressive decline in cardiovascular deaths uh, in uh, this country. But what you see also in this slide is that there's still a huge uh, gap between the general population and those with diabetes, with diabetics having a 33% higher instance of cardiovascular death. And so clearly we need to do more. Diabetics, unfortunately, are also at risk, not just of CV death, but a fourfold higher risk of a myocardial infarction, fivefold higher risk of a stroke, fivefold higher risk of unstable angina, and a five times higher risk of coronary revascularization procedures. And so clearly, we want to do more because the reality is, is that if you have diabetes, your life expectancy is decreased on average by six years. And in fact, if you have diabetes and had a stroke, that decrease is 12 years, and diabetes with myocardial infarction, that decrease is a reduction in lifespan of 13 years. Fortunately, there has been a, a true uh, explosion in terms of uh, therapies available for the uh, management of type 2 diabetics. Uh, three major classes uh, have been uh, studied in detail, uh, the DPP-4 inhibitors, the GLP-1 receptor agonists, and the SGLT-2 inhibitors. And this is a uh, meta-analysis of 13 large uh, cardiovascular outcomes trials and one real study totaling over 121,000 patients. And we see some very interesting results. The DPP-4 inhibitors actually have no impact on three-point MACE, three-point MACE being non-fatal myocardial infarction, non-fatal strokes, and cardiovascular uh, death. On top of that, when it comes to the GLP-1 receptor antagonists, they have a reduction in three-point MACE of roughly 13%, and the SGLT2 inhibitors roughly uh, 12%. When you look at cardiovascular death, once again, the DPP-4 inhibitors have no impact on cardiovascular death. Um, the GLP-1 receptor antagonist by an 11% reduction and the SGLT2 inhibitors have about an 18% reduction. So on the basis of this type of data, the American College of Cardiology in 2020 had their expert consensus decision pathway published and it was a, uh, update of their 2018 uh, guidance to prescribe SGLT2 inhibitors for adults with established cardiovascular disease and type 2 diabetes. So let's take a look at the uh, label indication for Jardiance. And, and the first thing that you see is a truly a unique, this is the first oral hypoglycemic agent to have this label indication, and that is to reduce the risk of cardiovascular death in adults with type 2 diabetes and established cardiovascular disease. 
It also has its original label indication, which is an adjunct to diet and exercise to improve glycemic control in adults with type 2 diabetes. Like most medications, it has some limitations. One of the key limitations is that it should not be used in type 1 diabetics and should not be used for the treatment of diabetic ketoacidosis. In terms of contraindications, we want to avoid it, obviously, in anybody who's had a hypersensitivity reaction to empagliflozin. We want to uh, avoid it in patients with severe renal impairment and stage renal disease or dialysis. In terms of the study that gave this label indication, it was the MPA-REG outcomes trial. And on top of being a busy clinical cardiologist, I've uh, ran a clinical trials unit and we were uh, a site investigator for this very important trial. This trial was published in 2015 and I remember when I first uh, listened to the uh, presentation, and uh, my eyes and jaws just uh, were just uh, stunned by the results because for the first time, we saw a very powerful effect of a uh, intervention in terms of reducing cardiovascular mortality. So let's get into the trial design. Like most of these large trials, this was uh, a large international effort, 590 sites, 42 countries. They screened over 11,000 patients to randomize 7,000 patients after a two-week placebo run-in phase. They were randomized to three arms. The first arm was just the standard of care. And by that, we mean uh, these are all cardiovascular patients. So they were expected to be on ACEs, ARBs, statins, and they're also all type 2 diabetics. And so they're expected to be on glucose-lowering agents, the drugs like metformin, SUs, and insulin. The other two arms were the uh, investigational arms on top of standard of care. They got randomized to either 10 milligrams of Jardians or 25 milligrams of Jardians. The key inclusion criteria, as already mentioned, was adults with established cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetics with an A1C between 7 to 10 percent and a BMI less than 45. The key exclusion criteria was a GFR less than 30. The primary endpoint was your very typical outcomes trial endpoint of a three-point MACE that being CV death, non-fatal myocardial infarction, or non-fatal stroke. But they also had pre-specified a secondary endpoint of CV death. So who got into the trial? This is the key uh, baseline characteristics. The mean age was 63, 72% uh, uh, men. Not as many women as we like to see uh, in a trial, but in a trial of over 7,000 patients, we have excellent data in women. Uh, they also had a better than a usual uh, separation in terms of ethnicity with 72% uh, Caucasians, 22% Asians, and 5% uh, Black African American. BMI typical of type 2 diabetics was high at 31. All the uh, patients had established cardiovascular disease. 92% had hypertension. Their blood pressure, though, was well controlled. Uh, patients had hyperlipidemia, but their lipids were well controlled. The mean A1C was 8.1%. In terms of renal function, about a quarter of the patients had a GFR less than 60. And in terms of the duration of diabetes, uh, more than half the population had diabetes for over 10 years. As I mentioned, uh, cardiovascular disease um, uh, incorporated a very broad spectrum of uh, patients. They were uh, patients who had multivessel disease, prior myocardial infarctions, bypass surgery, stroke, peripheral vascular disease, single vessel coronary artery disease, or cardiac failure. Like most clinical trials, one of the things that we always emphasize is that the quality of care in the study is at the highest level possible so that we can ensure that any difference you see can be attributed to the investigational agent and not because of poor care in the standard of care arm. And we see here that these patients were very well managed. Uh, when it comes to antihypertensive therapy, 95% of them were on uh, ACE inhibitors or beta blockers. Uh, lipid lowering therapy in excess of 80%, aspirin therapy in excess of 80%. And then when it came to their diabetes management, three quarters were on metformin, about half were on insulin, and about 43% were on SUs. Here's the key secondary endpoint results of uh, CV death. This is a Kaplan-Meier curve, very impressive. Over a period of uh, three years, there was a 38% relative risk reduction in terms of cardiovascular death. That's an absolute risk reduction of 2.2. When you see these types of curves, one of the things I always emphasize is first look at the start of the curves. And what you see here is that these curves separate very early on. If you were to um, blow up that uh, uh, the slide, you would see that the curves actually separate within a month. 
The second thing you pay attention to is what's happening at the end of the study. These curves are continuing to diverge over time so that the benefit that you're seeing over these three years is likely to be uh, extended beyond uh, uh, this and that there is no loss of benefit over time. These are the uh, force plots uh, and they're always busy slides, but when you ever see a force plot, really what you wanna do is look at that line of unity, which is the uh, um, uh, solid uh, bar at 1.0 and then look to see if there were any subgroups that benefited a lot or were harmed a lot. And what you see here is a very consistent result with Jardians. It didn't matter what your age was. It didn't matter what your sex was. It didn't matter what your race was, what your A1C was, what your BMI was, what your blood pressure or your renal function was. In all cases, Jardians did better than the uh, placebo arm or standard of care. Similarly, it didn't matter whether um, you were spilling a um, protein in your urine, it didn't matter the type of cardiovascular disease you had, and it didn't matter what your baseline CAD therapy was, was like. A couple of key groups that I do want to emphasize is the um, um, A1C, um, because it really didn't matter in the study whether your A1C uh, at, at the start was uh, above 8.5 or below 8.5, you had equal benefit. Similarly, when it comes to renal function, patients with renal impairment were benefiting uh, from this as much as individuals uh, with normal renal function. And also the type of cardiovascular disease, whether it was peripheral vascular disease, cerebral vascular disease, or coronary artery disease, there was benefit to the use of Jardians. Remember that the primary endpoint, though, was a three-point MACE, and uh, this study did reach statistical significance with a 14% relative risk reduction in that three-point MACE, which is an absolute risk reduction of 1.6%. You can see, once again, the curves separate roughly at around three to six months and continue to separate over time. But when you look at the individual components of the composite endpoint, you see that this was all driven by a reduction in CV death. There was not a significant impact on non-fatal MI or non-fatal strokes. So in summary, what the Emperor uh, outcomes trial was able to show you uh, was uh, that the use of uh, Jardians over a median time period of three years uh, was able to reduce uh, cardiovascular uh, death by 38%. That's a number needed to treat a 46, which in our healthcare system is, is actually excellent. Any uh, number needed to treat less than 100 is considered to be economically uh, uh, sound. So a, a number need to treat a 46 is very good. And that was on top of excellent background um, cardiac uh, therapy. So hopefully you're impressed with the efficacy data, but before you use any drug, you need to know uh, the safety profile and these are some of the key uh, um, things to focus on. One is uh, the drug does cause a diuresis. With that, you can get hypotension and intravascular volume contraction. And so we need to monitor for that, especially in, in patients who happen to be on diuretics or the elderly patient population. Ketoacidosis, as you know, is a life-threatening uh, uh, condition. And we do need to monitor for ketoacidosis because unlike typical ketoacidosis, your blood sugars may not be as high as you normally expect for a, a ketotic patient um, because of the mechanism of action of SGLT2 inhibitors. And so we need to be cognizant of that and check for acidosis. And obviously if they have it, uh, first of all, uh, discontinue the Jardians. And in fact, uh, one of the recommendations is that if somebody's at risk for diabetic ketoacidosis uh, or going for procedures like surgery, you want to consider stopping the medication three days prior to um, um, the uh, procedure. Acute kin kidney injury has occurred with epigliflozin, uh, part of it driven by the intravascular volume contraction. And so it just emphasizes that while we shouldn't avoid it in, in elderly patients, we may want to monitor it a bit more closely in that pop patient population and remind them to keep themselves well hydrated. And if we are seeing uh, kidney injury, then to discontinue the Jardians promptly. And if their GFR drops below 45 on a persistent basis, it's uh, important to discontinue the medication. Neurosepsis and polynephritis are, are known to um, occur um, with uh, Jardians. And again, it's something that we need to monitor for and treat uh, uh, promptly when it occurs. Hypoglycemia, especially in individuals who are on insulin or insulin street gogs, uh, needs to be watched for. And you may have to make some dose adjustments 
in their um, other drug therapy uh, to reduce this risk. Necrotizing fasciitis is a very common uh, uh, complication, uh, a very uncommon complication, um, but it's a very serious one, uh, especially um, um, want to monitor for that. And if at all suspected, discontinue the Jardians and treat promptly uh, to reduce the morbidity and mortality associated with this. Genetic or gentle um, mycotic infections, on the other hand, are very common. And uh, this is something that, once again, you uh, guide our patients uh, in terms of good bladder hygiene. But if it occurs, uh, monitor and treat as appropriate. We've already talked about hypersensitivity reactions. Obviously, stop the medication if there's an allergic reaction. Uh, Jardians does raise your LDL cholesterol. Um, but since most of these patients are in statins, it's not something that you're going to usually notice. Just a couple more things from the Yempa Reg Outcomes trial. As we talked about, you know, the drug works by causing a uh, osmotic diuresis, and so you will see a little bit more volume depletion, especially at the higher dose of 25 milligrams uh, daily. Uh, as we mentioned, urinary tract infections were common um, in the uh, trial, but again, with good treatment, good monitoring, and good guidance to our patients, uh, infections leading to discontinuation over a three-year time period were less than one percent. Similarly, when it came to uh, genital infections, uh, they occur four times more often in uh, women than in men, and um, uh, sorry, the UTIs, and then genital infections twice as common in women than in men. But once again, leading to discontinuation, that number was less than 1%. And so, uh, in fact, when you look at overall adverse events um, in the Emperor Reg study, more people came off placebo than either dose of Jardians just re-emphasizing that overall this medication is very well tolerated. This is just data now looking at all the various uh, um, uh, Jardians trials that uh, led to regulatory approval. And now uh, some of these populations weren't quite as, uh, as sick as the uh, Emperor population. Uh, so you see that urinary tract infections are still common, but not the double digits that you saw um, with the Emperor study. You once again see the female genital mycotic infections, uh, you know, uh, significantly higher uh, than placebo, as is male uh, genital infections. Um, and the other things are very similar to what we had already talked about. As cardiologists, one of our biggest fears is here our national societies are telling us we need to be initiating this therapy in our diabetics with um, uh, coronary artery disease, and yet we don't want to cause harm. And the biggest concern we always have is related to hypoglycemia. This is the data related to hypoglycemia. On its own, Jardians actually has a very low rate of hypoglycemia, in fact, no different than placebo. And we'll go into a little bit about why that happens. When you use it with metformin, which is the most common agent that we use uh, uh, with our uh, type 2 diabetics, again, the incidence of um, uh, hypoglycemia is relatively low and severe hypoglycemia was zero. Where you do see hypoglycemia is in individuals who are, have sulfonylurea therapy or are on some sort of basal insulin. And so this is where, you know, management of these patients involves teamwork. I have no trouble getting my patients started. And I think we as cardiologists should be initiating this, uh, this therapy uh, on our patients rather than leaving it to somebody else. But then we make sure that you know, either in a verbal consultation or um, in our uh, written notes to our colleagues, uh, whoever is managing their diabetes recommend a dose reduction in terms of the insulin or their SUs, because these are the ones that can cause hypoglycemia, and we want to uh, avoid that. One of the reasons why on its own Jardians does not cause hypoglycemia is because the uh, urinary glucose excretion occurs in a glucose dependent manner. So as you know, in, in the kidneys, uh, glucose is filtered through the nephron and the SGLT2 um, uh, molecule is in the uh, proximal tubule uh, and works to reabsorb the glucose. When you have an SGLT2 inhibitor, you no longer reabsorb the glucose and therefore it gets uh, excreted out uh, in the urine and as a result, A1C levels come down. So you're peeing out the sugar. But when you don't have as much sugar in the bloodstream, then you actually don't uh, eliminate as much sugar. And that's why we uh, emphasize that, uh, you know, the risk of hypoglycemia is actually very low because it's totally dependent on how much glucose you have in the bloodstream to start with. 
We don't know if this is the mechanism in, by which the reduction in CV death occurs. Uh, at the present time, that's not known. This again just talks about uh, some other aspects uh, uh, related to the use of jardians that uh, um, we want to be careful about the concomitant use of diuretics. Quite often in my patients, I will um, reduce the amount of, for example, hydrocortothiazide that they may be using if I put them on jardians, or if they're on some Lasix, I may reduce it from every day to every other day uh, to um, minimize the risk for volume depletion. I do emphasize to my patients that when you're on this drug, you will uh, uh, urinate more. And so it's important to keep yourself well hydrated. Certain populations, um, uh, pregnancy, not recommended. Breastfeeding, not recommended. And in the elderly population, just a reminder uh, to watch them more closely, both for um, volume depletion and for urinary tract infections. Again, as a cardiologist, one of the things I love about this drug is, is its simplicity of use. Uh, in terms of the cardioprotective benefit, it's the 10 milligram dose is all that you need. And so uh, in order to initiate this drug, all you have to do is start them on 10 milligrams once a day with or without food first thing in the morning, and then uh, really no dose titration required and really only a few considerations uh, to focus on evaluate their renal function, remind them about volume status, adjust diuretics if necessary, uh, discuss with whoever's managing their diabetes if they happen to be on insulin or SUs that they potentially will need dose reduction, remind them about ketoacidosis and, and, uh, and remind them that if they're going for elective surgeries or any time that they're MPO that they may want to uh, hold the medication for about three days. Um, after that, uh, very little in the way of monitoring, uh, other than uh, every so often assessing the renal function. And if their GFR drops below 45, it's not a reason to panic. It's look at why it dropped below 45. If they weren't drinking enough fluid, if they were on a diuretic that we can stop, then stop that. Because remember that in the Emperor Reg study, a GFR all the way down to 30 was allowed. But as the label says, that if your GFR persistently stays below 45, then you should be discontinuing the medication. And this just points out out here as well that uh, we do want to check the renal function. We want to monitor for signs of urinary tract infections or um, uh, gentle mycotic infections. We want to hold pre-surgery uh, for about three days. And when it comes to post-surgery guidance, it really depends on how, you know, what type of surgery it was, if they're going to still be MPO for a while, if they're still intubated for a while and they're not getting the, the glucose intake, then you may want to hold the... Uh, the medication until uh, those parameters have, uh, have changed. And so hopefully um, uh, with this presentation, um, you see the value of Jardiance. Here's a drug that has a proven cardiovascular benefit, a very impressive 38% relative uh, risk reduction, 2.2% absolute risk reduction to reduce CV death in our type two diabetics with established cardiovascular disease. It has an excellent safety profile with a hyperglycemia rate similar to placebo. Um, the caveat being that if they're on other oral hypoglycemics or insulin, uh, then you may need to adjust the dose. And it's a regimen that's very simple, both for us as prescribers and for the patient to take 10 milligrams once a day in the morning with or without food. And so with that, I'm gonna uh, close the presentation and open it up to uh, questions. Mm -hmm. Great, Dr. Singh. And as a reminder to the audience, please type your questions in uh, the question and answer function and we'll get to as many as we can today. Okay. Uh, so Dr. Singh, the first question that came through is, um, do we cancel the sulfonylureas when introducing empagliflozin or do we continue with it? So uh, that's an excellent question. And a, a lot really depends on whether you know what their A1C is. So for example, if their A1C is high, and um, I'm adding this on not only for its cardiovascular protection, but also to improve their A1C, then I'm not going to reduce their SU. I will caution them about hypoglycemia, but if their A1C is running high, that risk is low. If, on the other hand, I've got somebody who's actually got pretty well-controlled um, uh, uh, A1C, 7% or even 6.5%, and I'm now purely wow. using this for uh, cardio protection, then I will uh, tell them that, you know, I'd like you to check with your primary care physician or your endocrinologist, whoever's managing your diabetes, 
and would recommend that they actually decrease their SU at that time. Remember, uh, my general rule is try and get them off the SU since there is some potential for cardiovascular toxicity with it. And then the second thing I try and get them off is insulin. As you know, insulin causes weight gain, while the nice thing about Jardians is it causes weight loss, which is ideal for a diabetic. Another question that came through is, can you please explain uh, the number need to treat in more details uh, regarding the 46? Uh, what is the number? Is it patients or can you explain yeah. that? So uh, what a number needed to treat, the way you calculate is you look at the um, uh, absolute risk reduction and, uh, and then you can uh, be able to find out how many patients needed to be treated to reduce one cardiovascular event. So the number need to treat here tells you that you need to treat 46 patients for three years to save one life. And that is in our uh, healthcare system, uh, a very impressive number. As I said, a number needed to treat of uh, 100 or less is considered from a health economics point of view to be a viable uh, therapy. And so when you're down to a number need to treat 46, um, you know, that's excellent. And as you saw, very similar, although you can't compare trials, but very similar to the numbers need treat that we saw for statins with the uh, 4S trial and with ACE inhibitors uh, uh, with the HOPE trial. Okay. What is a more optimal combination in your opinion, empagliflozin and metformin or empagliflozin and a DPP4 inhibitor? Uh, it's another excellent question. And, and I would uh, strongly say that the, the better combination is empagliflozin uh, with metformin. As you know, metformin on its uh, own never had a clinical trial showing a reduction in terms of cardiovascular events. But metformin from the UK PDS study in a, a subgroup was able to show a reduction in terms of cardiovascular events. And therefore, we do consider metformin to be a cardioprotective agent as well. Um, doesn't have the same rigor that, uh, you know, Jardians does. On the other hand, we have done, you know, and I was involved in, all, in almost every one of the major DPP4 inhibitor trials. All of them showed an excellent safety profile. Oh, a couple of them had a, an increase in heart failure, but overall a, a very good safety profile, but not a single one of the uh, DPP-4 trials was able to show a reduction in cardiovascular events. And so when I've got somebody with established cardiovascular disease, I want to do everything possible to reduce their risk of dying. And, uh, and that's why I, I like the uh, combination with metformin. And along those lines, to the credit of, uh, of um, uh, BI, uh, Jardians actually has combination pills that can also make uh, um, the compliance uh, 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 factor uh, easier for, for our patients. Was the CV death benefit of Jardians and Emporic outcome correlated with change in A1C over the study period? Uh, another excellent question is, you know, uh, was this all just a, a benefit in the population uh, that had high A1Cs? And so you saw a little bit of that in that force plot where I, I, I pointed out that it didn't matter if your A1C was above 8.5 or below 8.5, you got equal benefit. In fact, um, they've actually analyzed that in a bit more detail and they found that it didn't matter what your baseline A1C was. You got the same reduction in terms of cardiovascular death. Also, uh, interestingly, they have of course, followed A1Cs during the three years. And it also didn't matter what happened to your A1C during the trial. So in some patients, A1C actually worsened over the three years. They still got the cardiovascular benefit uh, as much as the patients whose A1C actually um, um, uh, improved. And, and remember, Jardians does improve your A1C uh, uh, nicely in, in general. So what it really emphasizes is that it's not the changes in A1C that is driving the reduction in terms of cardiovascular death. Okay. And then has Jardians been shown to have an effect on weight or blood pressure? Uh, yes, in fact, I think that's what uh, makes this drug uh, so appealing that, you know, I started, uh, this was the first of the SGLT2 inhibitors I started uh, uh, doing research on almost a, a decade ago. And I go, nobody's going to take this medication. It seems to be so weird uh, in terms of the way it works. And yet it's uh, clearly once I get my patients on it, they love it. And they, the reason why they love it is not only are you bringing their A1C down, but you're also lowering their blood pressure. 
and you're also most importantly lowering their weight. And for a diabetic, that's the toughest thing to, to do. And so they're very appreciative uh, about the weight reduction that they, they see with the medication. And, uh, uh, and, and as a result, um, you know, these are things that I emphasize. Obviously, I'm prescribing it for its cardiovascular uh, death reduction uh, benefit. But I emphasize to patients because they're going to challenge you on, on uh, accepting a branded uh, drug that's going to cost them a little bit more money as to why should I be taking it. And emphasizing these additional benefits uh, helps uh, uh, to improve the, the chances that they will be compliant in the long run. Excellent. Well, those are all the questions that came through uh, via the Q&A. Um, I want to give you a huge thank you, Dr. Singh, for your presentation. Already comments coming through. What a great presentation you provided today. I also want to thank our audience uh, for your wonderful engagement and for attending today. And if you want to learn more about Jardians, make sure you head over to the Jardians virtual booth. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a wonderful day. Great. Thank you.